Hello, everyone. My name is Karenna Iliakis. Um, the title of my presentation is A History of Heavy Harvesting, Logging Through the Decades and the Effects on Riparian Forests. For my internship, I worked with the Department of Natural Resources in Washington State um, in their T3 watershed experiment. Um, and this is an experiment that looks at various post-harvest treatment methods to determine the best balance between economy and ecology, what gets the most bang for your buck while you're also protecting the environment. Um, so a bit of background for my personal research. Um, so for uh, riparian zones are the areas between rivers and land, and they can drain a lot of very diverse habitat. Um, think of the rocky shores where you might expect salmon to spawn. Um, and on the Olympic Peninsula, due to heavy logging, less than 10% of forests remain as old growth. And a lot of these harvests did not actually contain protections for riparian zones. So I imagine clear cutting a forest in a pretty delicate um, ecosystem. Because of this, I looked at the research question, how has historical logging affected the makeup of forest stands and riparian zones through the T3 experimental watershed? So what are the current, um, what's the current ecological makeup due to these historical events? Uh, for my methods, I began with a very simple digitization of various um, aerial imagery. So the imagery that I looked at is in figure two there, various decades and seeing what visible harvests were in there that I could actually turn into a map. Um, from there, I utilized various uh, historical and modern resources to create comprehensive GIS layer GIS map on these logging events. So in figure one, and you can see um, each of those individual colors is a different logging event through history. After that, I conducted a literature review of different variables that affect the health of forest stands and methods to mitigate damage. So be think best management practices. How can you harvest while also protecting the environment? And then finally, I collected and analyzed data on riparian forests, and this data included um, Simpson's Biodiversity Index, so how biodiverse is this, these, are these um, riparian zones, um, as well as the average DBH, for example, which that's diameter at breast height, so uh, how big is the tree at 1.35 meters from the ground. The results of this analysis show that there's not really a significant relationship between the calculated biodiversity index and the most recent year of harvest. So as you can see in figure three, it, while there is some variation from year to year, there isn't one year that stands out aside from 2013, which just makes sense because it's the most recent year of harvest. Things haven't really had the time to reestablish themselves. Um, there's also not a significant relationship between the average DBH and the most recent year of harvest, though old growth here do stand out as an outlier. Um, that is because old growth they're gonna be up to 400 years old. They are inherently bigger than younger trees. Um, but overall, there isn't really a sig very um, visible relationship between um, the DBH and the most recent year of harvest. However, there are signs that despite harvest leaving an immediate impact, so think again, that lower di uh, diversity in 2013, forest stands are continuing to show traditional cyclical forest cycles. So think pioneer species such as red alder that really situate the land, they're nitrogen fixators, they get it ready for other trees, those dying off and then being followed by climax species, which are the trees that you expect to stand for a long time. So I uh, think Sitka spruce and Douglas fir. And you can see that in figure four as there is, for example, very little red, uh, red alder before 1970, but there is a higher B, uh, DBH of trees such as Douglas fir and Sitka spruce, those ones that are standing longer. And after there, after 1970, there is a higher count of red alder, ironically shown in blue in this diagram. And the significance of this shows that despite consistent, these consistent disturbances, despite this harvest, riparian zones and their forests show that they're resilient and able to regenerate to some levels comparable to old growth. So we can imagine that in 50 years time, these trees will still be there. They will still be larger. They will continue to grow and these cycles will continue. However, modern logging methods, as they, despite being more sustainable, they still cause significant short-term harm. So again, think that lower biodiversity rate in 2013. They are still cutting down trees. They are still causing that damage, and that shouldn't be understated. But they, again, they are more sustainable than the clear cuts that we used to have. However, caution should be taken when comparing designated harvest lands to old growth, as these types of forests serve completely different purposes. You cannot harvest old growth like you can designated harvest trees. Um, and harvest lands are always being disturbed, so there will always be some differences in the general makeup of these forests. 
And then finally, more research should be done to examine other variables associated with riparian health with a larger sample size. So looking at uh, amphibious populations, looking at other variables regarding trees, um, just really getting more into the nitty gritty of everything with a larger sample size. Again, these were 22 sites across 16 watersheds. So there's a lot of room for expansion here. All right, thank you so much. I would like to thank my faculty advisor, Dr. Van Kane, for his guidance to this capstone. Um, thank you to my site supervisor, Theodore Minkova, and my uh, team member, Warren Devine, for their aid and continued support through all of this. And my cat, Frumpkin, for working, working ceaselessly to ensure I must check my work for cat-produced errors at every turn. And thanks to my other friends and family, too. I guess they're kind of important. Thank you so much.